Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Burlington Township Police Department's August 27th, 2020 Social Justice Town Hall, entitled Integrity, Service and Respect, Building Police, Community Trust in Burlington Township. My name is James Sullivan. I am the Public Information Officer for the Burlington Township Police Department, and I will be moderating tonight's event. Before we jump into the event itself, however, please allow me to give a little bit of background as to how we got here. The Burlington Township Police Department cherishes the relationship we have with our community. <coughs> as such, we have historically hosted and participated <coughs> in a number of initiatives intended to nurture and advance that very relationship. However, this is our first venture specifically aimed at the topic of social justice. Not to mention our first large scale online event as well. This virtual town hall and our agency's overall commitment to justice and accountability is born not only out of response to the spate of recent and tragic law enforcement involved deaths, but also out of recognition that the foundation of all police authority derives from the common consent of the community. And it's the community's respect, approval, and willing cooperation that makes it possible for us to function properly. It is born out of the vow each officer makes to our community when we swear our oaths of office, namely to serve with integrity, service, and respect. And it is born out of our belief that together, this community and its police department are capable of so much. The Burlington Township Police Department is proud of the men and women who work for our agency, and we fully believe in both their desire and their ability <clears throat> to serve this community with honor. But just as importantly, we recognize and respect that members of this community and many across the nation have been hurt by witnessing the mistreatment of their fellow man and woman at the hands of law enforcement, or maybe worse yet, that which they have experienced themselves directly. <laughs> Likewise, <clears throat> We uh, implore the, rela uh, the reality that many in our country still suffer inequities this very day across various platforms, so due to the color of their skin, the part of town they call home, the religion they may pursue, or the amount of money they have in their pockets. To be clear, the men and women of the Burlington County Police Department are not infallible, but we are most certainly committed. Committed to professionalism, committed to this community, committed to listen, and committed to the shared journey that lies ahead. We are so lucky to have with us tonight a diverse and talented panel of individuals who will be answering questions and speaking on the topics of social justice, police accountability and professionalism, and community engagement. But before I introduce those panelists, I would first like to introduce the Honorable Brian Jay, Mayor of Burlington Township, for a few opening remarks. Mayor. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to take the uh, opportunity to thank you all for accepting the invitation from Director Painter, uh, the Township Police Department, and the uh, Department's uh, Social Justice Advisory Committee to join in this conversation as to uh, how to strengthen uh, the police community relations in our township for 2020 and beyond. Communicating with the, with the community, communicating with the community is part of the uh, department's ongoing efforts to carry out its duties to the highest professional standards. Um, since 2002, the department has uh, been nationally accredited by CALEA. That means that they have met um, uh, some very stringent, um, uh, about 542 uh, standards that are set by a national accrediting board. To maintain its accreditation, the department undergoes a rigorous uh, recertification process every three years to make sure that the department's policies and procedures are consistent with the best practices in law enforcement and are being applied consistently and equitably in, in the department's daily uh, operations. While you, have, while, we have, while you can have the best policy and procedures in place, law enforcement is far more effective, as, as uh, Lieutenant Sullivan pointed out, if they have the trust of the people they serve. Uh, the department has taken steps in that direction. They've embraced and implemented a number of recommendations from President Obama's 21st Century Task Force Policing Initiative Report. The mission of that task force was very simple. It was to identify the best practices 
and otherwise make recommendations to the president on how policing practices can promote effective crime prevention and reduction <clears throat> while building the public's trust. Based upon those recommendations that came out in about 2015, 2016, uh, the department implemented some changes that are, are include, but not limited to, uh, embracing the community policing as a way of doing business. Uh, they have made sure that every member of the department has received at least 40 hours of crisis intervention training. Uh, the importance of that, uh, I'm sure Director Painter will highlight in his comments. Uh, they've developed a chaplain program, which is a partnership with our faith-based leaders in the community to facilitate better communication with our residents. Uh, several of those chaplains, uh, Matt Baldwin and, and Dorian Morgan, will be participating in tonight's conversation. Additionally, through the efforts, with the, through the cooperation of the uh, Board of Education, we now have an SRO in each of the Burlington Township schools. While their prime, the officer's primary purpose is to satisfy and uh, it was for safety and security, the day-to-day -day interactions with our students help our officers build a foundation of trust with our young people. The department has also sponsored very positive uh, non-enforcement activities, such as the Citizens Police Academy, the Youth Police Academy, uh, a national night out and coffee with a cop program. And as many of you may or may not know, uh, during the course of this pandemic this summer, uh, the officers have been out riding bicycles with our young people in the community just to um, be a face and, and, and to familiarize ourselves with the, with the, with the, uh, with the young families in, in, in our community. And finally, in the interest of transparency, they developed a, a social media presence with a website and a, a Facebook page. Uh, to better facilitate communication and interactions with our residents. On that website, um, you will find the department's annual reports dating back to 2013. Uh, those reports summarize the police operations in a given year and, and provide information regarding what training our officers receive, as well as um, uh, some statistics uh, about internal affair matters. And carried out its duties, the, the department takes very seriously and strives every day to meet its mission statement of delivering police services to our community with integrity, service, and respect. Listening to the input of the community is critical in carrying out that mission consistent with the ex expectations of those they're served. While we have to understand that this conversation tonight is, will certainly not address every concern or answer every question as we only have about an hour and a half of time, uh, please be mindful that this is an ongoing process and that I suspect uh, that those issues may be addressed in, in future uh, meetings of this type. Um, as indicated by, by the lieutenant, this is, an, you know, the department is very proactive. Uh, they view this as an opportunity for the department to, uh, to continue to evaluate uh, itself and uh, with the goal of doing its job of keeping the community safe uh, consistent with the community's values and building the trust of that community. So I wanna thank you all for attending. And at this time, I'm gonna turn the meeting back to Lieutenant Sullivan to introduce our, our panel for the evening. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. And now to our, our panel. First up, we have Bruce Painter, Public Safety Director of the Burlington Township Police Department. He began his law enforcement career with the Burlington Township Police Department in March of 1995. He held various assignments as a patrol officer prior to his promotion to sergeant in 2002, and he was promoted once again to the rank of lieutenant in 2006. He achieved his current appointment as public safety director in February of 2015. Director Painter is a graduate of Rowan University, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. In 2008, he attended the 234th session of the prestigious FBI National Academy. He is also a graduate of the New Jersey State Chiefs of Police Command and Leadership Program, and then he is a certified public manager, having achieved that certification through Fairleigh Dickinson University. Welcome, Director. Next up, we have Reverend Matthew Baldwin. Reverend Baldwin serves, uh, excuse me, serves the community as a police chaplain for the police department, and he is a Burlington boy born and raised. He's currently the student ministries pastor at the Fountain of Life Center. As, uh, excuse me, as, a, as well as one of our very own chaplains, as I previously mentioned. 
He enjoys personal fitness, coaching, teaching, and all things Chick-fil-A. His passion is to see people coming together to strengthen their communities through meaningful connections and truly He serves as deacon with the Tabernacle Baptist Church of Burlington, and he has years of service and volunteer work with such organizations as the Rotary Club of Burlington, Boy Scouts of America, National PTA, Head Start, and the Library Club of Burlington. Councilman Green has been married to his wife, Barbara, for over 40 years, is a proud father of sons, Jonathan and Jordan, both of whom are products of the Burlington Township School System, and an even prouder grandfather of grandsons, Jaden and Luke. Welcome, Councilman. Next up is Doreen Morgan. Doreen Morgan Esquire is a 1988 Burlington Township High School graduate. He uh, pursued his legal career by first attending and graduating from the Trenton State, from then Trenton State College with a Bachelor of Science degree in Law and Justice, followed by a certificate in paralegal studies from the Philadelphia Institute, then a stretch with the Burlington County Prosecutor's Office as a prosecutor's agent in the Victim Witness Unit, and ultimately, his uh, achieved his Juris Doctor degree from Rutgers Law Camden in 2001. Dorian was admitted to the New Jersey Bar and after completing a clerkship with the Honorable Thomas Smith in the Burlington County Superior Court Criminal Division, he opened his own law office in Burlington City in September of 2002. He continues today as a solo practitioner specializing in criminal, juvenile, DIFUS, municipal court, landlord tenant, and real estate matters. Dorian is also the founder and pastor of Restoration Station Christian Fellowship in Edgewater Park, New Jersey. The church celebrated 16 years of ministry and community outreach this past February. And he also serves the community as a police chaplain with our police department. Pastor Morgan, welcome. Next up is Liz Scott, who was a 1987 Burlington Township High School graduate. And she argues that the 87 graduating class is eminently superior to the 88 graduating class. She graduated from Penn State University with a degree in labor and industrial relations and a minor in African American studies, and followed that up with a master's degree from Rome University. Liz has worked in Burlington Township for the past 29 years, starting out as a sub, then an elementary teacher, and now she works as an administrator for the Burlington Township School District. She's a dedicated mother and wife who has a passion for equity, diversity, and inclusion. Welcome, Liz. Next up is Jayla Washington. Jayla is a Burlington Township High School student. Being a military child, she lived in many states before moving to New Jersey. She is the second oldest of four children and says that it is important for her to create a better world for her younger sisters. As an African-American woman, she believes it's important to speak out about the injustices committed all across our country. She was one of the organizers of two Black Lives Matter protests recently in our town. She is dedicated to creating change in any way she can it is most important for her to educate the youth about injustices, injustices in America and to figure out how to fix them completely. Welcome, Jayla. Two of our panelists who were unable to attend this evening because of some last minute conflicts are Maya Duesenberry and uh, uh, Jasmia Hidalgo. Uh, Maya is a Burlington Township alumnus who was born and raised in Burlington Township. And she's also one of the organizers and planners of the two recent Black Lives Matter protests held here in Burlington Township. She helped plan this protest because she wanted to spark a conversation in our community. She is very passionate about the topic and does not want to live in a world where a person's race determines if that person gets treated equally. She was recently named as Burlington County Woman of the Week and she's currently attending St. Elizabeth University. And last up is uh, Jasmine, Burlington Township High School student. Ever since sixth grade, she has always wanted to learn more about black history. There are a lot of things that she has taught herself over the years because she simply felt like the school system didn't teach enough black history. When Trayvon Martin was murdered, she started to notice injustice in the United States. When she found out about the killing of George Floyd, she knew she had to do something other than just post on social media. And she, along with the help of two of her close friends previously mentioned, decided to start a protest. She really hopes to educate and influence people to fight for what they believe in. And her next goal is to make change in our nation and end all racism for all upcoming generations. So to our attendees, you will notice that your video and microphones have been disabled. 
Only the panelists, video, and microphones will be active. This has been done in order to avoid bandwidth hiccups and to keep the event manageable. We already received several questions from the community during the registration process, and our intention is to begin by picking down that list. However, each attendee present can submit additional live questions for the panel by typing those in the, uh, the Q&A chat box. Time permitting, we will hopefully get to a few of those as well. Additionally, tonight's event is being recorded. We will be posting the and social media accounts for that. So I think we'll begin with a question for Director Painter. Please tell us what the Brown Township Police Department is currently doing and what you plan to do in the future to address issues such as social justice, police accountability and professionalism, and community engagement. Jim, I don't want to step out of line. I wanted to, to introduce the, 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 uh, the, the mission tonight before we jump into the questions. Is it okay to go back or do you want to answer the question first? No, by all means, sir, the floor is yours. Okay. Before I get to that question, folks, uh, tonight I am proud to announce the formation of a social justice committee designed to elicit open and candid conversations involving police and community relations. Though I have full faith and confidence that the officers of the Broadway Township Police Department perform their duties fairly and honorably on a daily basis, and though I consider this agency to be a progressive pace setter in the area of community relations, we simply cannot ignore those events nationwide that have caused, caused tremendous pain and heartache for far too many. Whenever and wherever the virtue of professional law enforcement law enforcement is called into question, we must be willing to listen, reflect, and improve. This committee will convene on a monthly basis to discuss controversial issues and the potential impact of our community. We will work to identify and address local concerns, explore training opportunities, and concentrate on how we can assist other entities with addressing their needs. As the group identifies topics of public concern, we will develop platforms such as this town hall style meeting or other venues we can inform the community or give others a chance to engage. Our mission is to build positive relationships and trust between the community and our police department by engaging in ongoing and inclusive conversations around the issues affecting our community. To demonstrate our commitment to social justice and deepen our awareness and appreciation for both community and law enforcement concerns. To collectively commit to collectively commit to maintaining a safer community for all Browning Township residents, businesses, and visitors. So the purpose of tonight's town hall was to introduce this initiative to our community and hear their concerns so that this committee can begin the process of taking on social injustice. To the question that was posed. <clears throat> Shortly after the George Floyd incident, this agency, along with our chaplains, engaged in what we would call a peer discussion block, where every officer in the agency took part and was able to either reflect and or comment on how the incident affected them, as well as our chaplains covering the history of differential treatment of the Black community. It was an informative peer discussion, and it brought to light the need to have these type of community outreaches to better inform our officers and keep them abreast of how their actions can affect the community whole. We helped organize JLA's uh, two, uh, and I say we helped because they did most of the leg work. We were just in the background uh, wherever they needed us, but uh, we took part in both. Actually, as we helped organize them, we also marched progressively with that. We also took the time to review our policies, procedures, updated them to clearly reflect a duty to intervene. Just to make it clear, in the past, our policies have always had a duty to report and an implicit understanding that all our officers were expected to intervene, but now it is clear that they must. We will continue to rely on our CLIA partners to keep us up to date with best practice policies. We are actively exploring training that deals with implicit bias, race trauma, and other social justice topics. We will continue to work with our school district's uh, initiative, equity, diversity, and inclusion team. We will plan to participate in initiatives of other entities. And as I indicated in the beginning, 
This social justice committee will work together to begin tackling areas of concern and community social injustices. Thanks, sir. So I think let's turn to the other panelists now. And uh, I think I'll pose this question to each one of you, and if you wouldn't mind taking them in order. As members of the director's newly appointed advisory committee, what do you feel about the relationship between the police department and the community at large? What are some ways you feel we've worked well together? And what are some ways we have not? And Liz, you're the first uh, face I see up in my panel, so you're first up. All right, let me unmute. Thank you very much. I guess I got the lucky number one spot here, huh? Um, first of all, bef before I, I jump into the question, I just want to thank um, the police department for putting this panel together. Um, I think it is going to make a difference um, as we all continue to navigate um, what has been unprecedented times um, that we're experiencing. Um, it's obvious that there's no such thing as a, a perfect police department. Um, there's no such thing as a, a perfect community, but we all have room for growth. But the one thing I can say about um, our PD and our community as a whole is that we are far ahead of the game um, when it comes to, to what we do here in Burlington Township. Um, to the police department, it's obvious that you understand the importance of building relationships and working together to understand other perspectives and get insight. One of the things that we have always said between our two agencies is that it is far better for us to come together and shake hands and build relationships so that we don't have to point fingers at each other later. And we've seen time and time again the benefit of this. Um, it's obvious that the Burlington Township Police Department is embracing the core value of lifelong learning and is definitely making strides. Um, the relationship that our school district has with our police department is not the norm. Um, and we appreciate the commitment of the department um, to work with our school community. Um, our SROs are making a difference throughout the schools with our students. Um, since the pandemic, it's, it's been obvious that they are making strides to continue to build those relationships and make connections with um, our students and be seen in the community. And it has made a positive impact. And we are very excited um, to continue to work together um, to just continue to grow. Um, with our conversations and with um, the various, uh, various initiatives that we have to take us to the next level. Thank you, Liz. Next up, I see Jayla. And uh, I'll just repeat it just, just so you, you have it is, you know, what, what do you feel about the relationship between the department and the community at large? What, what, some ways we worked well together and maybe were some ways that we have not. Yeah, I feel like we've worked together really well. I mean, doing the protests, that was very easygoing. The way that we communicated through that, it wasn't like, oh, we're scared you're doing a protest. No, it was very helpful. And you guys understood that we were doing it for a common goal to get better through the community and so that we don't have these types of problems anymore. So yeah, I think our communication is great. I think it'll continue to get better. And that's, that's all. Thank you, Jayla. Councilman Green, same question to you, sir. Okay, got the mute off there. Oh, I'll speak as a resident, as a councilman, as the son of a police officer and as a friend of the police department. Um, over the years, our police department, and the first two words I wrote down, first of all, are Kalia and proactive. Our police department, as my wife calls from the post office, hold on for a second here. Um, our police department has always been very proactive, very open doorish, very proactive. Um, and the big thing is when there have been issues, we've always addressed them from the councilmatic point of view. Had, 
head on um, with an open mind. I find that our police and our police department have pretty much always been approachable um, and also open to criticism, um, warranted or not. Because oftentimes, you know, we expect perfection. And kind of like Liz mentioned, um, we're not perfect, but we are probably one of the best in the area. pre calia we've been one of the best in the area, as duly noted. Um, we are involved in the community events, from church events to school events. Um, Without hesitation, our police department is always in the forefront of volunteering for said activity. So we do that very well. And this also goes back to the preschool pre resource officer days as well. Um, we're, so things that we may have not done so well, the key to that is we've learned from them. And we've bettered ourselves as a result of that. If we were to look at or review the CALEA audit on the findings that they have from our filing, from our investigations, from the manner in which we do things, we are, again, one of the best. Um, it's a bragging point and has been a bragging point for me for years. And again, I say that not because my son is an officer, but going back to the four different chiefs of police I've served, on, served under, um, it's gotten better with each term. And that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And next I see Reverend Baldwin. So um, speaking as a Burlington Township resident, as well as a local clergyman, um, one of the things that I've always seen Burlington Township PD do is not only try to actively um, control the narratives uh, that enter our town, um, but with the help of our town initiatives, our town council, um, local input, we're not only able to control it, but create and curate the the local narrative and I, what I mean by that is making sure that um, other national headlines that even though they are emotionally impactful um, that they don't uh, interpose on our day-to-day -day life here um, obviously we want to take a stand for what's right but we also want to do it in a way that makes sense for our community uh, and I've always seen the police listen first and then act um, They've always taken input from all of our local uh, religious affiliations as well as our school and uh, our local businesses as well too. So I've seen us do uh, good in that sense, but I've also seen um, uh, the need for us to ongoing create new avenues to do that, right? And one of the great things that we're doing is creating this, uh, this racial equity panel. Um, without initiatives like this and initiatives um, like Jayla and her friends are doing, um, we can't continually create and curate the ongoing or the future of Burlington Township. And we have to be super proactive in that and we can't be complacent, nor can we act like the national headlines could not ever happen here. We can't just hide our heads under a rock and act like uh, we're invincible. Uh, we're not, we're just a normal town. But because we're a normal town and we're being proactive, I think that we can stave off uh, major incidences like these um, with local input. So um, really just making sure that our, our local PD has community engagement. And thank you to all of our attendees who are here tonight. You guys are the ones that are proactive. Uh, encourage your families and your friends that are listening or, or that aren't listening to listen to the, uh, the recording post, uh, you know, when we're done, because it's important for them to be engaged in this as well. The more community engagement that we have, uh, the more input that our uh, local PD has, uh, the more firepower that we have to, uh, to put out fires when they start or to preemptively stave them off altogether. So, um, you know, it's really just cheerleading each other on, you know, the, the police has to be open to criticism. Like uh, I think that was uh, uh, Councilman Green said, uh, and the PD is, um, I know Director Painter, you know, personally, and then he's, he's a man who's going to be able to final review everything and, and also, uh, make sure that our men and women on the force are doing what they need to do in, in a respectable and a honorable way. Uh, and above all, you know, being above reproach in all things. So uh, let's just continue to curate, create, and control the narrative here in Burlington Township. Thank you, Reverend. Next, Pastor Morty, counselor, in question. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to also say thank you 
uh, to police department, uh, director painter for inviting me to be a part of this uh, advisory committee. Um, I've been a resident uh, of, Re of Burlington Township most of my life um, and, and have grown up through the school system as well as watched several police chiefs and, and directors. Uh, and I'm uh, impressed uh, as an attorney because I, I work with uh, police departments throughout the entire state uh, and Burlington Township uh, remains one of the top police departments uh, to deal with. Um, truly uh, living up to, to the motto of, of um, integrity, uh, service, and, and respect. Uh, so I thank you for what you've done with that. Uh, I've heard it said already proactive. Uh, I do appreciate that uh, we are proactive. But some people might be watching this for the first time thinking that this is a response to either last night or uh, I mean this, this week's um, uh, shooting or uh, even to the George Floyd. However, we were together uh, several years ago, uh, starting this kind of dialogue with, with the town and with, the, with its citizens as to how better the police department can um, work together with the community to make sure that Burlington Township is the best uh, community around. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, Lieutenant uh, approached me, and I can say this, uh, that he approached me pre-COVID uh, in fact, early during the year to say, let's get these um, talks back together. Let's do some more town halls. And uh, unfortunately, due to some scheduling, uh, we didn't, we weren't able to get it. Uh, however, it was already in the thought process and already working uh, behind the scenes to make this happen uh, before George Floyd, before, in fact, before uh, Maude Marbury and, and some of the other ones that happened this year, we had already discussed getting together. So I thank you for the proactiveness of the uh, police department, um, things to work on. Uh, I've already seen uh, and, and heard tonight, uh, excited that um, uh, Chief Painter, uh, Director Painter mentioned that no longer uh, are the uh, officers just uh, required to, to um, report uh, bad activity, but now they have a duty to uh, intervene. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, and, I, and I'm glad that that, that has been put into place here, uh, as he said, it's been a culture of um, an assumption, but now it's it's in writing that the officers have to do that. Um, I think the one step uh, that can go even further uh, is finding a way to be um, 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 transparent with the community. And and I, I thank God we haven't had this situation here yet, so it's it's hard to kind of uh, forecast what would happen. Uh, but I know in most police departments, when there is an investigation going on uh, into uh, some possible misdeeds on behalf of a police officer, um, the uh, departments tend to uh, circle the wagons and, and, and keep uh, the community out. Uh, so uh, if there's something that I would suggest is, is coming up with uh, our, our plan ahead of time, if something should ever happen, uh, that this is how we're going to handle it so that we are totally transparent uh, to the people uh, and citizens of Burlington Township. That would be my only uh, encouragement. But thank you again for allowing me to be a part. Thank you, Pastor Morgan. And if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of stick with you as a bit of a follow-up to that question. Um, and it, it, it's really, what are the most critical social justice challenges that, that you think we face today? You know, what changes must be made and how do you hope that this, uh, this advisory committee that's been impaneled can contribute to those changes? Do you, uh, do you have any um, uh, specific next steps that you, you would recommend in addition to the one you already have to strengthen our communal bonds and relationships? Yeah, um, well, one is, is this, and I'm, and I'm glad we, we, that this is not just a one-time um, uh, a town hall meeting, but it's going to be an ongoing uh, meeting of the advisory committee so that we can hear from the constituents uh, of the town and bring it to the, to the board or bring it to the police department so that we can continue to act proactively. Um, I guess that's my only, my only thing is that we should have more ears and eyes out in the community. Uh, so many people are afraid or, or uh, don't feel comfortable bringing their concerns to the police. We wanna make sure that we have opportunities for them to be heard, even if they're afraid to come directly to the police department. So I'm glad that we are, you know, hopefully 
uh, our faces will be known in the community, um, our numbers, our, our email addresses, whatever, so that if, if members of the community do have concerns, um, we can be there to, to advocate for them. Um, that is uh, one thing that I'm uh, in the middle of, of coming up with some sort of adv advocacy group for citizens who have concerns uh, about police, about uh, whether it's a, a specific uh, incident or whether it's just police procedure. I, I think that the community should have input as to um, how they're policed, if you will. Uh, so uh, I think that that's something that partially is already in place. Uh, as well as uh, some more that can go to the next step. The next step is is getting uh, a, a greater opportunity for members of the of the community to be heard, uh, even if they're afraid to come out themselves and and do it. So that's that's something that I would suggest. Thank you, sir. And uh, we'll just kind of snake our way back, Reverend Baldwin. Uh, you know. What are the most critical challenges, social justice challenges that we face today? And what do you think are, are changes that need to be made? And how do you hope that this, this committee can, can help bring about those changes? Well, one of the great things about being a, a local minister is uh, being able to be in on an intimate conversation with multiple people all the time. I, I mean, that's kind of the, the pastoral work that we do. Um, and being kind of a conduit or a mouthpiece to kind of gather that information and disseminate it where it needs to go. I think one of the challenges that we really face um, is making sure that um, the, I guess the overall emotional um, well-being of our people uh, in, this, in this town, uh, those that have been directly affected by uh, these national headlines, um, it's, it is, it's traumatizing. And um, I think one of the things that we can do as, as local ministers um, and, you know, people in authority and leadership is recognize that number one. And then number two, figure out ways that we can minister to and, you know, holistically treat people who have been affected emotionally, because we know that um, uh, the heart and the emotion control a lot of our uh, action. So uh, if we can treat people uh, on the inside, maybe we can control what happens on the outside and I think that's one of our, our largest challenges is really figuring out emotionally where our people are at. And when I say our people, I mean Burlington Township. Um, and one of the greatest ways to do that is in, um, you know, a church environment or a religious institution of your choice. Uh, even if you're not a member of a congregation, pop into a local church and, and tell them how you're feeling. Um, even if you want to report that to the police and uh, we can, as a local chaplain, you know, come out. And, and talk with you. That's one of the great things that the chaplains do. Our work is to uh, minister to the community. It's not just to our local co congregations, it's to our local community and our officers. Um, this also goes to our officers. Our officers are also emotional people. They're just normal people. And um, emotional people make emotional decisions. So, you know, getting a gauge on where our people at emotionally, I think is one of the largest concerns. Um, I'm not really sure how to fully go about that, I just know that uh, myself, you know, Pastor Dorian, as well as the rest of our chaplain team are definitely available to talk with anyone, even if you aren't, uh, you know, religious whatsoever, and you just want to talk with someone in a uh, counseling or a therapeutic manner, you know, we'll definitely make ourselves available to that. <clears throat> I hope that would uh, kind of answer that question. I think it did, Reverend. Thank you. And uh, to Councilman Green, I, I'll, I'll pose the same question. Uh, you, you have a, a, a longstanding history of, of uh, involvement in, in social groups and, and uh, advocacy uh, initiatives. Uh, so what do you think the most critical social challenges are that we face today? What changes uh, need to be made and, and, and how can we go about that? I think right now, one of the most critical challenges that we face is just getting the information out there, communication. If you look at just, announcing a council meeting. Not everyone subscribes to the newspaper. Not everyone has access to the internet. Um, not everyone, not just seniors, have no, no use of social media. So we have to figure out with the town halls and even in communication, how best to disseminate that information out there. That is not a social justice challenge, but it's an umbrella over the challenge. Just getting the information to those that need the information. Oftentimes people get misinformation, bad information, um, and we need to 
be a barometer of or for that, but also be in a position to have an open ear and open heart to correct that. I mean, some of our gentlemen are chaplains and ministers. I'm a deacon. We go out, we visit, we talk, and it's not about religion. It's about what the individuals need, where they're hurting, what they're feeling, and oftentimes to console an individual, oftentimes just to listen. Um, both ears, but more so with the heart. Um, so that's how, that's just one way of um, addressing the needs and the hurt of the, today's society. So it's kind of like an indirect answer. It's not necessarily a challenge, a social justice challenge, but it's a, a means to an end. And it will never end. Thank you, sir. Into, uh, into Jayla as, as, a, uh, as an accomplished organizer of two very impressive events. Um, same question to you. What are, what are the most critical social justice challenges we face today? What changes need to be made? And, and how do you, you hope you, uh, you and this committee can um, contribute to those changes? Um, I have to agree with Mr. Baldwin that it's like a really emotional thing that everybody is going through, like every, every person of color, every person that's not a person of color, everybody's going through these types of emotions where they sometimes don't understand, they need to be educated. Education is a big thing too. If they don't understand it, how are we gonna make the steps to have change? So we just have to really communicate with our community in the ways that we cater to their emotions and we're making these conversations so that their emotions are contained and they know that not all cops are bad people. Like we're making those communications so that everybody understands everyone's point of view. Yeah. Thank you, Jayla. And, and to Liz, uh, for those in the audience that, that aren't aware, Liz is the uh, one of the, the, um, the uh, the people in the school district spearheading uh, those critical conversations that you're having from within the school district in the community. So the same question to you. So looking at this from, from various lenses, um, I think it's very important that we embrace transparency, um, embrace real talk, open talk, open talk, and truly address um, the raw emotions that many people are, are feeling right now. Um, as the mother of three African-American boys, um, young men, I, I should call them, um, and being the wife of an African-American <sighs> man, um, my anxiety levels are, are very high. Um, while everybody I feel comfortable within the confines of, of Burlington Township, my anxiety just goes in overdrive when I know that they're going outside of what I consider to be um, a safety bubble. And when my children walk out the door, it's, it's not the same. When my children get behind the wheel of a car, that anxiety is there. And it's important that people understand that um, things may not always look the way they seem. And it's important for us to have these conversations with each other in order to understand where people stand, what their perceptions are. So communication is key. Listening to each other is key. Um, being able to understand what someone's um, viewpoint is on a particular topic or situation is key. And the bottom line is, is just overall education is, is key to this. In, in terms of um, specific next steps, um, I think it's continued relationship building. Um, we had our critical conversations with our parents last, last week or the week before last. And just the conversations that they had and the insight that was gained um, was, was huge. Um, it's also in, important to understand that a lot of what we're seeing now um, has a foundation with um, implicit and in some cases explicit um, biases that people have that they may know they have or they may not understand that they have. 
So it's important to continue um, to participate in, in critical conversations and allowing yourself to be uncomfortable um, and allowing yourself to have the hard talks and have critical self-reflection because that is how um, all of us are, are going to grow. So participations in these programs is critical. Um, you know, I can say to, to our community that um, the, the school district is going to be having um, equity trainings where we're going to be working in small pockets of that with various members of our community. And the police department has said, hey, our guys are going to participate in, in that. And that's what it's going to take in order for us to be, um, to, in order for us to move forward. Um, and just, you know, as a police department, just continue having your proactive mentality um, and embracing the open and honest communication and, and being willing to listen. As I've said in, in our other previous conversations, um, this is not a race, it's a marathon and it is going to take us a very long time to move ourselves forward. Note I didn't say eradicate, but it's about moving forward and growing. Thank you, Liz. And uh, Director Painter, uh, you know, same question. What are the most critical social challenges that you believe we are facing today? What changes need to be made? And, and how do you hope that this, uh, this advisory co committee can contribute to those changes? Well, I do agree. In fact, Liz, up 100%. Our officers will be taking part in those, those small pocket groups. Hopefully, uh, this COVID-19 uh, epidemic uh, ceases at some point. We can get these in person. Get these in person, or I think it, it will have even more feeling when they can actually be in the, in the pocket, living it and seeing it. Um, yes, uh, communication is, is obviously the biggest thing. Uh, on the police end, we are every police officer gets and, and rightfully so gets lumped into to the to the that group when there is a an action that, that has been taken uh, that does not look good, is not good. Uh, is is a, a, a illegal act or a questionable act, um, and some officers feel that that's it's unfair. But um, it, it, put that scale of fairness uh, to to the, the community is impacted first. The, the law enforcement officers impacted. Um, officers have to be accountable for their actions. We have to be accountable for the actions of, of other officers. And even though we're not, we may not be at fault, we do bear the brunt until we can professionally, we want to be treated as professionals, then we need to professionalize the, 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 police, the, the police community where we do take it in brunt and we step up and we take action to say these actions are wrong. We don't try to cover them up. We do not try to hide behind uh, certain case laws that say we don't have to, we don't have to disclose or we don't have to um, identify. Uh, our, we have a very aggressive attorney general right now that, that is finding, he's hitting roadblocks because of, uh, of uh, predating laws that, 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 that limit how much information police are required to give out or legally can give out. Um, and it, it is having an impact on uh, how we communicate with our community. And that is unfair. So I hope that he uh, is successful in, in lifting some of these, these, these barricades, these barriers that, that prevent us from getting the, the word out. To, to, that we, to, so we can speak if our officers are involved in something that is questionable or doesn't look good. So we can get out in front and better explain what is going on. So um, we can try to avoid the appearance that we are hiding, that we are we are trying to not be forward or transparent. Um, we need to, you know, and that's where uh, as our, our departments can work together with, with chiefs associations and our county prosecutors to start working on better, uh, better rules of engagement, as I say, to, 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 to lift uh, these barriers and remove them so we can start being more transparent. So I think that um, is one way we can limit uh, the, the, the inference that we are um, the cause of, or we're continuing the cause, or we're, we're perpetuating the cycle of uh, social injustice when we can actually start combating it right from the beginning. So hopefully there's some changes that come about. 
hopefully we can start to get out in front. And again, um, we can only be heard if we get together, uh, speak about it, and move, you know, and address us with, with our uh, uh, elected officials and in, uh, in the state to, uh, to start looking at where we can go to improve uh, the relationships. Thank you, sir. We've got another question that was uh, submitted during registration. I think I'm going to direct this one at Liz. Education and awareness are big parts of minimizing social, social injustice. How are the school districts working to adapt the curriculum to educate all sides of history? So the Burlington Township Board of Education um, has made a commitment through our All Students Achieving Plan, which is our, our goals um, that we adopt every year. And they have made a commitment to address equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, not only through our curriculum, but addressing our hiring practices and through ongoing staff training and the revitalization of our district's equity team in order to address equity, diversity, inclusion, and inclusion in our district. Um, we are working to review and evaluate our current curriculum across the content areas in grades K through 12. Um, we are reviewing and adopting novels and other texts um, that are representative of the principles of diversity and, and equity and inclusion. Um, our administrators, the staff, and key stakeholders are being, um, they are involved in various professional development um, opportunities and articulation around the, the whole idea of equity and cultural competence. Um, we continue um, to build a, a diverse collections of uh, materials in our media centers and working hard to include titles that address the issues of equity at age appropriate levels. Um, again, the training is going to be huge and, and we have started that already. Um, any new staff member who comes into our district um, goes through equity training. Um, it's about a two hour training. And this year with the adoption of our equity team, we're going to be expanding that. Um, I'm working with um, one of our supervisors to actually give um, Jayla and um, the other young ladies an opportunity to speak directly with one of our textbook publishers because it really struck me in one of our conversations that they were saying um, how they felt there was a deficiency in what we were teaching. Um, and, you know, a lot of things um, come about where, that many people follow the textbooks. Um, and we all know growing up that our textbooks are not necessarily representative of um, what our culture is as a, as a country. So at some point, I'm hoping very soon, um, they will be able to sit down with the publisher and just provide their perspective um, and give the publisher an opportunity to ask questions of them to gain insight. So, you know, again, what these three young ladies um, have done um, will have, I'm hoping, a huge impact outside of the walls of Burlington Township. Um, the district is, is committed um, to looking at the equity, the inclusion, and the diversity in all aspects of our school community and, and branching out um, to our community as a whole through the trainings is going to be key because as we grow within the district, it's important that we grow as a community and that way we can all work together, we can grow together, we can learn together. And that's why we're gonna continue do doing our critical conversations and addressing um, what it is that we need to address openly and honestly. Thank you, Liz. And, and while we're on the, the, uh, the subject of the school, I'm just I'm, I'm kind of perusing some of the live questions. Mm -hmm. One of them uh, was geared towards, you, you previously mentioned, I think you and the director both mentioned the interaction with, uh, between the school resource officers and the students within the school. I, and, and I take from this question is a little bit concerned that now that everything's virtual, they're going to be missing out on that interaction with the officers, that positive engagement with the officers. Are, uh, I suspect you probably have some creative things in mind as to how to keep that engagement up, right? 
So I have to say, um, this summer has been a summer like no other. Um, but I, I have to give kudos to um, our SROs. Um, they have embraced the TikToks that they've been doing. Um, our students have loved it. Um, their, their donut eating contest was, was uh, a hit. Um, I personally had an opportunity to see um, our officers um, in the community with the bike with the cop and the Rita's and the Kona ice. I mean, it's our SROs are, are, are second to none in our police department as a whole, because in these events, it's not just the SROs, it's other members of the department out there engaging with, with our students. And they see that and you're reaching out to them through the social media. So it's been um, a key factor in my opinion. And again, as, as a mom, um, I've seen the outreach and um, you guys are definitely on the right track with that in terms of um, reaching out to the kids and, and making yourselves present. Um, some of the SROs have reached out and said, okay, Liz, what, what other things can we do outside? And, and we've been bouncing around some, some ideas. So um, kudos to our, our SROs in, in maintaining that connectivity um, with our, our students. It definitely makes a difference. And I know as we move forward into the 2020, 2021 school year, that we will only take that to the next level, working together in partnership. Thank you, Liz. Next question, um, I think I'm going to direct these, uh, to, uh, this question, excuse me, to, uh, to Councilman Green and, and Jayla. And it, the question is, what recommendation do you have for uh, people in the audience who wanna become more informed about and involved with social justice initiatives? And I think a piggyback on that is kind of another live uh, comment uh, expressing concern that the most disheartening issue is the refusal of people to acknowledge that racism is real. And the first step is tackling any, in tackling any issue is acknowledging that it exists. So what, what recommendations do you have for, for people who want to become more uh, informed about, involved with uh, social justice initiatives? Okay, I guess I'll answer first. Um, I guess it really does smart, start small. So like, if your family, so some of them don't really understand. I think it's important to educate your family first, maybe see how to educate them. Um, it's pretty easy. Look stuff up online, educate yourself through movies, TV shows, like articles. There's a lot of stuff out there to have easy access to educate yourself. Even though it might be difficult, I think it's smart to start small through your family, through your friends who don't understand and then move into trying to educate other people. Thank you, Jayla. Councilman? Well, in terms of keeping an informed society, um, our township website is a wealth of information, as are the county website, the various church sites, and Liz Scott and the school system, have they've always been very proactive in keeping us aware of any and every um, event that's been available to our township. And of course, the three young ladies that started our Black Lives Matter march and protest. Um, in terms of the, the racial issue, first one has to acknowledge, believe and see it. Um, I, I find that using an analogy about the way we treat people that are different, redheads, freckles, tall, skinny, fat, you know, we treat people differently based on the visual. So it should, to me, that makes it easier to understand the, the racial issue that we have here. Oftentimes though, it's so deep seated that you still can't, as much as you try to impose upon an individual that he or she may have a little tinge of racism in their body or in their heart, you know, you, you still have that uphill battle and it oftentimes it turns out to be a fight. Um, not worth not worth the time of day, but it's worth learning from that to make your, yourself stronger in terms of your, your next um, opportunity to try to work with someone with respect to that issue. One of the notes I wrote down earlier 
on the question of the critical social justice challenges is what it, it what intrigues me is that individuals will listen but they won't hear they'll see it but they really won't see it so whether it's at the epidermis or dermis or deep seated within their heart they know my wife says you know pete they know um, some people just refuse to admit they know uh, racism has has been and will continue to be but we wanted it to be like the one percenters not the 99 the police that have you know caused a lot of this the, the strife in our in our nation one percenters not the 99 um, not i don't want to sound apathetic about that apathetic in terms that it will always be and i accept that but if we can convert one person change one person the way he or she thinks and it goes back to the way I'll struggle with this, Ra raising my sons. I had to explain to them, you know, this is a great township, very diverse. People are going to love you. The older you get, the more they will distance. Um, because of, and it's hard for me to even, the, the race card, the difference card. Um, they've seen it, but for those of you that know my son as a policeman, or my son Jonathan with that chatty Kathy smile, you can tell they were raised to accept, believe, and if a parent or an, an older person or a different person just sees them as that's just a black kid and ignores him, they not accept it, but they understand. And they're strong because of that understanding. Um, so we have to make strong children, like the three young ladies here. You know, we just have to impose on them to be strong, stand your ground, learn from your mistakes, learn from others' shortcomings. But you know that the book on the civil rights movement the eyes are on the prize keep your eyes on the prize we do that i think our police department does it no i know our police department does it our school system is very proactive um chaplains have grown over the years to a very inclusive group male female black white we you know it's just that's our township so there's going to be racism but we will smother or suffocate the racism with everything that we do Thank you. Well, thank you, Councilman. Jimmy, can I just add one one thing to what Councilman Green just said? You certainly can. Um, I think it's also very important that we see people. Um, one of the things that I always tell our new staff when they come in is never to say, I don't see color. And what I say to people is, if you look at me and you don't see that I am an African-American woman, I think you need to go see an optometrist because the reality is I live in the skin that I live in day in and day out. And it's hurtful when people don't see me for who I am. So as a society, um, as a school system, as a community, it's very important for all of us to recognize and acknowledge people for who they are, what they are, and, and what they look like, because that disacknowledgement is not a good thing. Thank you, Liz. Next question is, as a small business owner who wants to hire ex-felons, are there re-entry programs I can contact to schedule interviews? Are there any incentives, tax credits, grants in place to encourage hiring of ex-felons in Burlington County? Um, and I think I'll direct that at, at, at Reverend Baldwin, because uh, unless I'm mistaken, that's prisoner re-entry is something that you are very much uh, invested in. For sure, thanks LT. Um, to address the question, um, hats off to you, number one, as a business owner who is willing uh, to do that, to hire ex-felons. And uh, to answer your question thoroughly, yes, there is. Um, I have the honor of chairing Burlington County's Reentry Task Force. And it's something that I got involved with last year. And there is Reentry Task Force in multiple counties across the state. Um, again, I get the honor of chairing that. Um, there is federal bonding available to you almost instantaneously uh, as a, a business owner. There's wage compensation. There's um, training uh, available to you as someone, a business owner who wants to venture into hiring a parolee or 
uh, an ex-felon. Um, these are things that the task force can help you do. Um, I wonder, LT, what is the easiest way to get out my contact information? Uh, so that way I can, uh, whoever this is that asks or pose the question, I'd love to partner with you in doing this. And anyone listening um, who's interested in hiring our ex-felons who are coming out of incarceration, which by the way, uh, in New Jersey over the next few months uh, will be released at a very, very rapid pace. Uh, there's new legislation coming down. Uh, which will uh, release a ton of prisoners uh, into our local communities. And one of the best ways uh, to embrace them is holistically, uh, treating them emotionally, uh, getting them financial stability, helping them find housing, uh, getting them uh, socially acclimated. And these are all things that the task force does with community partners like yourself. Um, so again, LT, I guess I'll throw it back to you. Which is the easiest way, or what is the easiest way for that person to get in contact with me or receive my contact information? Either way, again, hats off to you for wanting to do that. Um, it's, uh, it's an honorable thing that you're doing, uh, a very helpful thing. And uh, if we learn to embrace our men and women who are incarcerated, I think we'll, our communities will be long-term uh, long better for it. Yeah, Matt, so um, I think when we wrap up this evening's event, uh, aside from putting out the recording of tonight's event, uh, I think there's been a few questions already submitted, and I see a few in the uh, Q&A queue that lend themselves, I think, better to a more thorough written response. Sure. So maybe, uh, and again, to, to the extent that you're willing to put your contact information out there when we uh, kind of release our written responses, I think that we can include that in there. I know um, Officer Pugh should be on, on host duties right now, so he'll make a note to, uh, to include that. Awesome. And uh, as well as I uh, just want to recommend a county resource, there is the Burlington County One Stop Program, um, which you can uh, get training as a business owner, as well as anyone who knows someone who is a parolee, who is coming out of incarceration, or might be recently released. They can stop in at Burlington County's uh, one-stop program. You can get information that's at uh, in Wood Lane Road at our county complex. And uh, these are very, very helpful county resources. Um, again, I'll make myself available to you as a business owner to help you get, uh, you know, our men and women hired and get you trained and also get you compensated for what you're doing because it's honorable. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Next question up, uh, it's a bit lengthy, and I'm, I'm going to direct this one to both Director Painter and, and uh, Pastor Morgan. And I'll, um, uh, it says, if we're concerned that we might be witnessing a dangerous interaction between police and a black citizen, i.e. a black person at gunpoint or who's been removed from their car with a huge line, excuse me, a huge line of squad cars surrounding the scene, and we're worried, what is the responsible, safe way for us to respond? If we intend to stop at the scene, what guidelines should we follow? And this, um, this question is, um, is a common refrain. I think we've heard this a couple of times before. So I, I, I understand this is something that the, the community is very much interested in. All right, I'll start. Um, again, it's a difficult question to answer in that, yes, uh, when you have any scene with a, a gun involved, it, it's an automatically inherent dangerous scene. Um, and if you're rolling up or coming into this uh, activity uh, at a point where there's already activity occurring, um, you may not know what has happened prior to. And yes, there is that dangerous appearance. So I would say this, if anyone's ever rolled up on anything they thought was a crime being committed and or some kind of illegal activity being committed, police involved, not police involved, is be the best witness you possibly can be. Mm -hmm. Keep yourself at a safe distance. Uh, if you have a cell phone, record it. Um, uh, your safety is just as important as the safety of everyone else involved in that scene. Uh, bringing another body into that scene could could have an as adverse reaction that wasn't wouldn't have happened, but then uh, uh, just a cause and effect activity uh, could result in. Uh, an innocent uh, bystander getting hurt. Um, and again, we don't know what the actual initial call was. 
So I would say be the best witness you possibly could. Videotape where you can. And remember, our officers are also wearing body cams and also recording the incident from the patrol cars. So yes, the police will have video evidence of it, but any additional camera angle could give it any adds credence to the investigation in later uh, that could come about. Also, don't be afraid to call 911. Yes, we know the police are there, but yeah. call 911 and ask for a supervisor to respond. Uh, and that way, at least um, you are actually now, um, uh, when you make that 911 call, there is there is documentation showing that there, there, are, third, there, there are other third-party concerns that are being uh, called into to the 911 station and, and bringing attention to this scene. So uh, in simplistic terms, I, I, the appearance may look bad, um, but you getting involved as a third party or a non-participant could end up creating a even uh, bigger hazard. So be the best witness you can, record if you can, call 911 if you can. Um, and uh, yeah, Dory, I don't know if you want to piggyback any more on that. It's kind of you, tough without you had to back to hand. You answered it, uh, Director, the way I was going to answer it, um, that you should, in essence, and I love that, that, that uh, phrase, um, be the best witness you can be. Um, you do not want to become a participant in, in whatever the police activity is. You do not want to approach the police officers, uh, certainly from behind or even in front. You just want to get, as, as the Director said, at, at a safe distance where you can um, videotape on your phone. Um, if you can call 911, if you think something is really uh, illegal to let the um, dispatcher know that something else going on um, and, and just continue to watch, uh, uh, it becomes tricky. You might wanna say, I am I am recording so that everyone knows that you are recording. Uh, if you think that someone's doing something un, you know, untoward, hopefully, you recording it uh, will get them to uh, back away from whatever they were doing uh, that was illegal. Uh, but do not, uh, I, I, I can't stress that enough. Not only does that put you in danger, uh, that puts whoever uh, is, is, is the object of, of the activity, I think sometimes in more danger. I think also it puts the police officers in danger because again, you don't know exactly what is going on. And if you take the uh, attention away uh, of an officer who is actually trying to do his job, it does put him also or her in danger as well. So be the best witness that you can be uh, and then pass that information on. Thank you, Dorian. Um, Next question, and uh, I think this one is geared uh, best towards Director Painter. Are, the, uh, are your officers trained to handle people with mental health issues or de-escalate issues? Yeah, let's try that again. Are your officers trained to handle people with mental health issues or de-escalate situations without arresting anyone? That was a uh, pre-submitted question. I see it at least once, if not twice, on the, uh, the Q&A queue as well. So again, something the community has a uh, great interest in. I'm going to handle this in two parts. One, I'll address the, uh, the mental health issue uh, directly. Uh, as the mayor had in indicated in his, uh, his introduction, uh, CIT, Crisis Intervention Team Training. Um, every officer in Browning Township, with the exception of one who just graduated the police academy, has attended CIT training. To put that in a little bit of perspective for you, um, the, the, the AG referenced earlier uh, in his uh, current initiative, is promoting that officers get CIT training. So uh, again, not to, to tout our hat, but we're ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to this type of training. CIT training is a 40 hour uh, class um, where our officers uh, do uh, role play scenarios, uh, deal, uh, talk with professional uh, counselors that, that train them on how to um, have a better understanding when they are dealing with someone with a potential mental issue, how to help identify. Uh, so they, when they do respond to a call dealing with someone suffering from a mental uh, illness or mental uh, uh, breakdown or, or some kind of action that, that may look uh, wrong or criminal at the time, 
uh, you know, because 10 years ago, that, that person was like would have been arrested and, and, and charged with some kind of offense and then and, and dealt with as, okay, we arrested and it's done. Uh, where now the officers will take the time uh, to actually uh, evaluate this, this scenario, see what is actually occurring. And instead of making that arrest, um, we'll reach out to the, purples, the appropriate social uh, uh, caregiving or uh, a mental health uh, provider uh, to help uh, along with the call. Um, there's some good outreach programs out there that we partner with uh, that the officers are put in touch with when they go through CIT. And this CIT, uh, by our own doing, is refreshed every two years uh, with our officers. So uh, they get the initial 40-hour training in it, and then every two years they receive a refresher training in it. Um, and again, that is um, uh, a two-fold training because uh, there is some de-escalating tra de-escalation training in that CIT class. So our officers get uh, some uh, some de-escalation tactics uh, during that class, how to talk with people because the, the, the the practices they learn in CIT are, are just as good outside of a, a, a crisis or outside of a mental illness call uh, as it is in. So uh, it's a two-fold training for them and uh, has some de-escalation techniques in there. Um, and yes, um, as I answered, uh, you know, we deal with, if, if it's a non-criminal, if there is some kind of alleged criminal act and or there is action that, that must be referred to the court, um, prior to a charge being typed, we will uh, speak with uh, you know, an appropriate uh, judge uh, to see if there uh, is deemed enough probable cause even prior to the, the arrest point. So it doesn't, uh, we don't waste the time and we actually can seek out the, the appropriate help for the individual. Uh, when it comes to de-escalating situations, uh, again, uh, Burlington Township uh, twice annually trains in use of force. And in that use of force training are de-escalation uh, tactics. Um, our officers are taught uh, from the academy and as they come out that uh, when, it, when at all possible, do not use force. But when force is needed to be used, uh, use the least uh, amount necessary uh, required in a given situation. Um, so, um, it, 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 most of the uh, use of forces uh, that we see in, in, in our uh, jurisdiction um, uh, deal with uh, uh, trying to uh, usually occur when we're apprehending uh, a, a, an individual um, and there's some sort of resistance. Um, you know, it's, it's never any, any resistance is never good and the sight of force being used is, is never good. Um, but I can assure you that uh, our officers, uh, they are trained and emphasized twice annually to use the least amount necessary to effectuate that, that arrest. Um, if you look at our statistical, uh, they're not, uh, they are, I don't have them in front of me right now, uh, so I can't give you the actual number, but um, in our use of force scenarios where uh, an injury has been received uh, by a, a su subject being apprehended and or the force is being used. In, a, in a, almost 95 to 98 percent of the time, if an injury has been received, it has been minor in nature. When I say minor in nature, uh, scuffs, bruises, um, there's no um, uh, serious injury and or uh, uh, injury that has caused some kind of um, abnormality or, 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 or or deformity. So um, yes, uh, again, when it has to be used, uh, we, we, we choose, we hope never to use it, but when it has to be used, um, we hope that our officers uh, are using the, mo the minimum required to do it. And when injury occurs, uh, I assure you that uh, it, it is documented and we do get aid if needed. And uh, so th these are big issues uh, for us and uh, they are important to us. Um, but uh, Yes, uh, to, to answer that question uh, simply, uh, we, we, we do um, have uh, training in mental health uh, issues and in de-escalation uh, techniques. So, um, and also while I'm on that, um, to even take it further, uh, as we said, uh, um, dealing with situations without arrest, uh, we are an agency that uh, is taking it even beyond um, mental health uh, concerns. Uh, we have, uh, partnered with our, 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 our 
prosecutor's office, uh, our prosecutor, our, our courts, and our, our, and our um, Dorian is, is the uh, defense counsel. Um, we are the one of the first, if not the first, uh, police department that has developed a municipal court diversionary program. Um, and this deals with uh, subjects that um, uh, find themselves uh, dealing with uh, this really person's offense revolving around the use of, of drugs. Uh, and uh, the thought here is instead of, uh, again, uh, when, when the, the, the issues are minor, the rest are minor, instead of, instead of a prosecution, uh, we, we defer them uh, to, a, uh, to a, a facility to help treat, uh, it, it, it has to be voluntary on the part of the, the subject, but uh, in lieu of charges, we look to, uh, to, to, to get that uh, individual help instead of uh, prosecuting. So, uh, you know, to tout the uh, Browning Township, yes, we, we feel we are uh, ahead of that curve yet again uh, with trying to uh, avoid uh, prosecutions when necessary, trying to avoid force when it's not necessary, and when it is necessary to use the minimum amount required. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, sir. Um, and just, just a, a bit of a quick follow-up I see in, in the live Q&A is, um, uh, de-escalation training and tactics, especially as it relates to people of color. And I, I think you mentioned, and in, 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 if I'm misstating this, please correct me, that uh, though the, the training that's received in CIT is, is um, primarily geared towards mental health uh, incidents, the training uh, does uh, lend itself to, 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 um, to multiple platforms, right? Whether it be uh, mental health or j just good general um, de-escalation tactics. And I think you also mentioned earlier this evening about um, the engagement that we're getting ready to have with um, our men and women about uh, implicit bias, uh, biases and, 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 and the like. And, and we're hoping that that would lend itself again to um, how uh, de-escalation um, uh, can be exercised when dealing with, with people of color. That is correct. Um... And again, uh, situations dictate what happens. So to, to give a, a blanket answer to that is difficult, but um, it, is, it is important to us. Uh, and again, uh, in, especially in today's uh, era of policing, that yes, we, uh, our officers, um, the better educated they are uh, in the area of de-escalation and dealing with um, uh, different uh, races, different cultures, different uh, ethnicities, that uh, they, they have, they take a different approach when, when handling calls. Uh, but again, uh, the safety uh, of our officers is paramount um, and the safety of the people they're dealing with is paramount. So uh, we will do our best uh, every day to, 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 to appropriately uh, perform the jobs uh, required uh, of our police. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it uh, looks like we've got about a little bit more than five minutes left. And I, I think so now would be a good time um, to kind of just turn it over to the panel for some, some closing remarks. And um, uh, since we're, we're on you, Director, I'm not sure if you have any last uh, words you would like to say. First off, I want to thank the panel for joining us. I want to thank the, the, the people that just listened in and for those that submitted questions. Um, again, this is not a one-time uh, event. We will, uh, this, this group will be meeting, as I said, on a monthly uh, basis. Uh, from your questions here, we will start to see if we can pick out some topics already that we can begin these discussions. And when we feel that the, there is a, uh, an important topic that needs to be covered, it needs to be broadcast, it needs to community involvement, we will set up platforms such as this. Uh, hopefully when the COVID-19 epidemic is set, is set aside and done, we can start meeting in live. Uh, and that would uh, give us the opportunity to have actual town hall meetings where we can be, uh, meet face to face. Uh, and we can get down to these uh, questions quicker um, and work together there. Uh, I do want to indicate real quick that uh, the NAACP uh, local chapter out of Willingboro has expressed interest in joining this group, and I'll be working with them to get uh, a representative uh, on the board as well. Uh, so I just wanted to let them, if they're listening, I would appreciate it for getting back with us. And yes, we will have you uh, shortly uh, aligned into this uh, committee. Um, with that, uh, yes, the, the, as we said, the Burlington Township website will have, uh, uh, or the Police Department website will have a, a place where you can um, voice concerns, type them in, get them to bring it to our attention. 
Uh, so please look for that there. Uh, and uh, again, thanks uh, and thank you to, to the panel here and thank you for all uh, who joined. Thank you, sir. And uh, to the audience, that, that feedback portal on the website is, is right on the homepage. If you look at the top banner, it says submit feedback, click on that and you can submit any, any uh, comments, compliments, complaints, questions, et cetera. So uh, turning to Ms. Scott uh, of the esteemed class of 87. <laughs> That's right, class of 87. Um, I just wanted to say that um, a big thank you to the police department. As, as I started out earlier saying that um, our community and our police department is far ahead of many, um, what we're doing here tonight just speaks volumes and just shows um, what our police department is about, what our community is about. And um, again, I challenge those who are um, listening to us to continue to step outside of your comfort zone. Um, when we start having these uh, trainings, please um, be willing to be a part of it because this is how we are going to change the narrative that, that we are seeing as a society. And although Burlington Township may be a, a small piece of the bigger picture, um, it has to start somewhere. And why not let it start here with us in Burlington Township? Uh, we are the home of the Falcons and we are a resilient community. And um, again, I just wanna say thank you um, for asking me to participate. Um, and I want to thank you again on behalf of the school district for your continued partnership in making a difference in the, in the lives of our students. Thank you, Liz. And to the incomparable and ever so accomplished and uh, uh, Ms. Jayla Washington. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to our police department, to our school district, to the entire panel for not just being continuous, just continually putting an effort to continue this and just making change small to create it more big. I just wanted to thank everybody for the panel and continuing to do it. Thank you, Jayla. Councilman. Well, good evening, and I too would like to say thank you so very much to the panelists, to our police department, also to the attendees that joined us tonight. And in closing, I would like to just remind everyone to listen to our youth. Thank you, Jayla. Thank you, sir. Matt? Um, big thank you to all of our attendees. Um, again, you guys are the, the heroes here. Um, we're just mouthpieces for you guys. Um, so the feedback that you guys give us is critical. Um, continue to um, do the work of racial equity. Um, as long as hate exists in the human hearts, um, the fires of racism won't go out uh, and no amount of legislation will ever um, extract hate out of the human heart. Uh, we all have to do that collaboratively together uh, so let's continue on with empathy and understanding um, and realize that uh, all of us, all of us uh, need to be proactive. Um, and uh, again, uh, again, thank you to the PD and uh, for being just amazing at what you do. Continue on honorably. Don't stop. Um, be the trendsetters, you know, uh, for Director Painter and the rest of the department and LT for those who are listening. I know there's uh, some participants here, the attendees tonight, who are our local officers. You know, that just shows you that they care. Uh, if you're looking at the attendees there, you'll see a list of all of our amazing officers who are listening. So hats off to you guys. Um, but let's continue to work at this together and let's uh, be committed to it. Uh, don't just be in uh, thought or speech about it, be in action uh, and always go forward in love. God bless you guys. Thank you, Reverend. And uh, Pastor Morgan, counselor. Sir, um, again, thank you uh, to, to the police department, uh, Chief Painter, um, for this forum. Uh, I do want to, I, as, as uh, Pastor Matt uh, and, and um, Councilman Green said, I wanna thank you, those who tuned in 
uh, because you are really the most important part of this process. Um, be involved, get involved, be a part of the solution. Uh, if you're not a part of the solution, then the truth is you, you, you help perpetuate the problem. And that's from any side of it. Get involved. I'm glad that you tuned in. Continue to tune in. If you see something, say something. If you have a question, ask. Um, if you have a suggestion, let us know because uh, none of us have all of the answers. Um, and as we run this marathon that, that uh, Ms. Scott is talking about, uh, it's going to take a team effort for us all to get to the uh, finish line together. Uh, and finally, I just want to say as a, a proud member of class of 1988, uh, we don't have to tout how great we are. Um, everyone knows it. Uh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> way to put an exclamation point on it, Dorian. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I, I think that concludes this evening's event. Uh, I, too, would like to thank everybody who's, who's come out this, this evening, from the, the panelists to the attendees, uh, the mayor, and, and everyone in between. Um, and, and just before I sign off, as I've listened this evening, I can't help but uh, continually think of one particular quote from Mother Teresa that just seems to resonate right now. And it is that if we have no peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. Thank you, everybody.